Welcome back to the Everyday Night. I'm Joe. And I'm Jeff. And uh, Jeff, rather than uh, one of our usual uh, tangential uh, digressions to start, I'm going to start with the traditional question we always ask, what are you drinking tonight? Oh, well, in fact, uh, I have just made a quick blend together of ingredients that I gathered over the weekend. I have a Knob Creek smoked maple bourbon um, and an equal amount of fresh apple cider and a splash of fireball. So it's a nice sort of fall nice. cocktail. A little sweet, but not too sweet. The maple bourbon is not particularly sweet. It's not a very strong maple, just a hint. And the fireball it works as a bitters against the sweet. And because it's a fresh apple cider, not sweetened apple juice, it's also got enough enough to fight the sweetness. So Nice. I, and you, sir? I just went to a place that had, they served a smoked old-fashioned yeah. with actual smoke. But the way, mm -hmm. instead of smoking it once it was in the glass, they poured the the bourbon and the bitters two kinds of bitters into a bottle and put smoke in that and then <laughs> rotated it to thoroughly infuse the bourbon with the smoke and then poured it in the glass. It was very effective. Uh, hmm. good. I mean, it's just at home, but what I have is a glass of bubbly ah. because I'm celebrating. Oh, if I'd known, I would have celebrated with you. What are we celebrating? Celebrating. The publication of my <laughs> of my get this right for the of my newest book. Oh, all right. Congratulations. The Meow Show at 50 from Cultural Rebellion to Comedy Institution. Uh it's about the 50 year history of uh the longest running student comedy sketch comedy and improv show. In the country, I was oh. on the staff the first year, and um, I got to interview more than a hundred people, talk to a lot of people. Uh, forward, as you can see, by Seth Myers. Yes. Um, um, I talked to uh, well, a, a famous alumni of the show include Seth Myers, his brother Josh Myers, Anna Gasteyer, Kristen Shaw. Uh, Dermot Mulroney, um, um, quite a number of of very well known. Uh, you people. you interviewed Kristen Schaal? Yeah. Oh, I think she's fabulous. I I, I oh she her. was she was great. She was wonderful. She was really really good. Um, well, and how fortuitous that you can plug this for our literally dozens of viewers. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm telling everybody. Like so. <laughs> that old joke, but. So I am celebrating because it was, it was a lot of work. I know I mean, you've been working on it for, for some time. So congrats. Thank you. Um, and um, um, some book events are in the planning stage. So oh, signings and signings things, so on. things like that. Yeah. Probably, probably people have been be interviewing you for your book. You really and, book. and I've been interviewed by the a couple times for the student newspaper um, on campus. And um, actually, I wrote a guest op ed for the student newspaper um, that I think could be the subject of our another episode. So I'll get oh. to that another time. So, all right. Um, so, <clears throat> that being said, it also says <laughs> leads into our subject tonight. Um, to some extent, yep. Yes, because every word, every interview, every caption, every everything in that was created by an actual human person. <laughs> All the yes. photographs were taken by actual human people. The designs, the layout, all of that was done by actual human people. 
which brings us to our subject tonight yeah or the opposite of our subject tonight yeah, exactly <clears throat> um but yeah but good on you for doing that all as the as the human person or the i mean i'm sure you're talking about layout people and yeah and, and all that stuff. I, I initially i initially wanted to design the book myself as well as writing it as i did my first book mm -hmm. um they said they first of all they they couldn't comprehend that somebody could write and design <laughs> um and then they said no we we just focus on the writing and i think that was the right decision because i had my hands full with the writing however i did curate the photographs and um <laughs> there's a lot of research that went into uh, and a lot of um various techniques to find all the programs and all the and the graphics and the stuff over 50 years that people right, did, sure. did not think about preserving for the future so yeah before yeah. before digital encapsulation yeah. i mean yes. could, actually i assume somebody had to find and scan actual photographs yeah yeah <laughs> wow yes okay well so what uh I thought we might talk about um, this evening is my sort of first foray, my encounter into generative AI um, and uh, and the terrifying nature of that as a graphic artist, yes. um, how how easy it was to to completely supplant, sidestep, leave behind the the actual work the method that it takes to get a piece of artwork that that a you know not just a piece of artwork i mean a specific image in a publishable format as was, as a designer an artist a painter a writer the i'm adamantly opposed to generative ai um but i think first before getting into that we need to explain at least i need to explain the difference between what i'm referring to as generative ai and analytical what i'm calling analytical ai <clears throat> i think analytical ai can be valuable um, and the example is, uh, I was at the dentist and they took the usual x-rays they take and they put, run it through a program mm -hmm. that's an AI analysis. And it visually highlights areas that the dentist needs to check. It needs a human to check the work. Right. Sure. So it, it, it's analyzing data and pointing things out. And that makes sense to me, but it's not as if the dentist was turning over a control to right. this and saying, sure, you found all these, just, you know, power up the drill. And it's not like, yeah, it's not all automated. It wasn't a, yeah, it wasn't a robot doing your dental work. It was right. And, and that dentist was using it as a, as a tool to help him yes. do his job better. Exactly, a tool of analysis. Right. And I think that that's fine. That's valid. Um, Generative AI, though, including writing and image making, is, I, I object to it being called artificial intelligence. It oh, is, so do I. It's yeah. plagiarism software. It's powered by all the images that were, and the writing that was created by actual human people, um, ACPs, actual AHPs, actual human people, <laughs> persons. And that, um, that it, the, the images that I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the quality of them because that will only improve over time, but it's scraping the internet for, images for words it's being educated trained on right. people's work 
and those people did not give permission and were not compensated. And in the um, the user agreements that most of us simply don't read through and and sign, right? There are things in being embedded in those now about anything you create with this software will be used to train AI engines. I think if you if if you upload it to the cloud, for instance, I think you can I think you can safeguard your work that yeah. way. Um, but I think anything you publish to any kind of social media or anything you upload to the cloud becomes fair game under the circumstances you're talking about. Yeah. If you don't do either of those things, if you just save it to your local hard drive and it just sits there, I think it's safe from that. Well, but I, that makes it, given the nature of, say, um, how work is marketed, advertised, promoted, communicated, if you don't post it publicly, share it, um, it, it won't, can't be found. It won't be found. Well, I guess it depends on who's looking for it. Yes. Yeah. Um, but um, <clears throat> portfolios, most designers' portfolios, most artists' portfolios, they're online. It's expected it will be online. And and this is kind of where uh, – so let me just give you the story of what I – the experience I had this week sure. with this thing. And I, I just needed to create an image – to use as a cover for a potential podcast I'm going to do. So I just put in literally a sentence. Wait, wait, this is not your, you're cheating on, on this podcast with another podcast. <laughs> I didn't, I shouldn't set a podcast. I want to, I want to experiment with a, with a TikTok series. Okay. So yeah, not a, not a podcast. Um, you're the only, you're the only one for me, Joe. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for the so, reinsurance. Um, so uh, I just put in literally one sentence and very simple, com very simple series of, of requirements. And it gave me the, this particular uh, AI generator. And I agree with you. I don't like, it's not artificially intelligent. It is a very sophisticated algorithm that's that's going through a certain amount of pre-programmed steps and coming up with this thing. So mm -hmm. if if it if it was truly intelligence, it wouldn't require my input to do something. Right. So in any case, that that's a little digression, but um <clears throat> and it it handed me four images that were remarkably good. I mean there were problems like you the quality problems you're saying like you know, there's too many fingers on this hand and, and that kind of goofy shit that you that you immediately look for to determine whether or not this is AI. None of those problems were, well, in one of them, none of those problems existed. I thought, okay, I can use this. Now, I then took it into Photoshop and I cut it into a bunch of layers and I made adjustments and I added textures and I massaged it this way and that, but I realized that the image they gave me because it, I didn't get a choice of what size of image I wanted wasn't the right proportion to do what I needed. So Photoshop's generative AI, first time I've ever used that to extend the background, both to the side and, mm -hmm. and to the top that I had less problem with that because it's really just sort of mimicking what's already in the image. And, it, and it's a it's yeah that strikes me as a tool yeah that i could use to extend my image it's right. my image i'm working on it's not someone else's image um and but the fact that i was using a generated image yeah going into photoshop and then further generating from that image man i had no i all I had to do was decide that this wasn't the right size and Photoshop would fix it for me. Yeah. There was no, you know, back in the olden days when oh, you yeah. were a, 
you know, as a professional photographer, you had to anticipate the use of your yeah. photographs and lay them out to leave room for text or whatever. You know, this was, it was all part of a process that a human had to figure out. Well, for and as, as an art director, I would, I would do, do a layout first yeah. and direct the photographer. I would art direct the photo yeah. photography to leave that kind of room. Yes, and then exactly. there were, there were, um, I mean, I've been using Photoshop since before it was numbered. It was just, yeah. you know, the first iteration of it. Yeah. And there were techniques, there were workarounds then for doing things. The, right, sure. The, you, could paint, yeah. you could actually paint backgrounds and exactly. do things like that. Um, the, so, I, I did see uh, an art director talk about trying to do what you're talking about. But he uh, typically what an art director would do is say, get a concept, uh, describe something to an illustrator and yeah. or a designer and get something back and then say, okay, I need this here and I need this different. And so, yeah. and so he tried doing that with, I forget which AI, you know, mid journey or chat GP, or one of the image generating mm -hmm. ones. And he, so he got something back and then he marked it up essentially as we would have said right. and then gave it back added those additional prompts and they came back with it came back with something completely different it couldn't right. make iterative changes right to couldn't its own own yeah. work it couldn't adjust the image it already had it had to start from scratch every single exactly. time exactly yeah and i got i got that too um even though at another time I was playing around with it just to see what it was before I actually had a use for it. I put in a prompt and I probably hit the generate button 30 times. And after a while I started seeing the similarities. I started seeing a, a pattern, a, a template that it was using or, you know, a handful of templates that it was using over and over again, which told me that my, what I asked for was specific enough that it didn't have a lot of um, examples to draw from. So, to, okay, and that's just exactly what you're talking about, is that, that it's, it's pulling somebody's art or several people's yeah. art and trying yeah. to make something out of it that you've described. Now, I back in the day, and I, I know that this interrupt myself here this can make us seem like luddites and oh. the luddites were not opposed to technology they were opposed to the automation of um, um weaving machines i think yeah. yep because it was going to put people out of work they weren't a and they thought the work was of lesser quality. So if we use that definition of a Luddite, maybe I am um, mm -hmm. when it comes to AI. But um, the <clears throat> um, that I interrupted myself and forgot the initial thing I was oh. going to say. But um, well, maybe it was just about what a Luddite is and, and how we're, you yeah. said that we are, we are sounding like Luddites and we're just opposed to this technology. We're sounding technology. like the, the misunderstanding of what Luddites were. Um, right. I'm not opposed to technology when, well, I remember now. So back in the day, pre Macintosh, pre digital mm -hmm. work, when things are all done analog, you learn to draw, you learn to write, you learn to. And if I didn't have, a, if I needed a reference to draw, I would find things. I used to have um, what was called a clip file. And yeah. it was uh, under A, there's ants and aardvarks and Acropolis. And under B, there's, and you had all, this collection yeah. of images that you could use now they weren't original images necessarily. I mean, they were clipped right. from 
magazines and but you right. didn't use them exactly you didn't copy them to no. violate copyright use them to inform your understanding of the thing you needed to represent right um and um you know so when when digital work came in i adopted the tool very quickly there were some i remember some at the time older art directors who said it's just a fad it's never gonna never gonna catch on I, it's like no this is this makes some things a lot easier not everything right. uh, but some oh. things but and there's and there's things like uh for instance shutterstock for instance is a company yeah. that supplies sort of generic images stock photography yeah right that wasn't a thing before the digital age right. either so well, what what would do before before i could get images digitally as downloads so there were several stages of it there was digital composition but before that uh, i mean after from there the internet wasn't developed enough to enable you to download images for layout yeah right so i, I when i was working on um client work in agencies i would call my representative at the stock photo company and say i need these kind of images I right. need an image of I need an image of the Roman Colosseum. I need it horizontal sure. with a lot of space um, for a copy. I need and they would send me um they'd send me transparencies. Hmm. And okay. they'd be in sealed out sleeves, sealed clear sleeves, um, where I could I could scan them. Right. And then use that low res image in a layout. And if it was approved by the client, then I could open the envelope. Oh. You break the seal, you you pay for it. Hmm. And anything that the seal wasn't broken, I could return. So that's mm -hmm. how that worked. Then it became digital downloads of those images um, that you could use the low resolution for layout purposes only and then yeah. you could and they were usually watermarked or something for exactly for layout purposes exactly yeah. um so i'm not opposed to digital tools um but the the i i've seen a, a trend where companies said need a logo design and they just they post i've seen competition sites here I'm offering, you know, a hundred bucks for a the winner of this. Yeah, you get dozens of submissions from Malaysia, yeah, Vietnam, India, India places Sri Lanka, where they'll just yeah. they'll crank out a whole bunch, and a client who doesn't know any better will pick one they like rather than one that will work for them. Right. Sure. Because they don't know any better. And it only cost them a hundred bucks. It's the equivalent of, well, what do I need a professional designer or a professional agency for? My cousin's neighbor's son has a computer. Well, yeah, exactly. We both encountered that over yeah. our careers. Yeah. Um, that also, your your example reminds me of the, of uh, Sun Tzu, I think, said that if you're, and this is a management has become a yeah, he said he said if people are using generative ai destroy them no no he would have though i bet he would have yeah. but he he said that if your if your uh enemy has a lot of chariots and that's a problem for you that they have so many chariots tell your captains that you will give this bag of gold to no this might have been genghis khan now that i think about it Give this offer this bag of gold to the one who brings you the most chariots. So they're all out there taking chariots and killing chariot riders and bringing them back to you. Only one of them gets the punch of gold. And that's the same kind of attitude is that make it a contest 
everybody competes thinking they could win, but you, they've just spent a lot of their time. Right. You know, hundreds and hundreds of hours were spent for one, and only one person got a reward out of it. And which actually is, um, having worked in the the incentive industry for a while, yep. that's actually counterproductive to incentive incentivizing people. But right. I think the what's going to happen is that's not going to go away because the guy who was offering a prize of a hundred bucks is now going to spend whatever on, on the software and just write a prompt or I've actually seen, seen um, ads, job postings for prompt writers. Yes. That's a, that's crazy. Yes. This is, and this is where this is why I wanted more why I wanted to have this discussion yeah. is as somebody did with, somebody did say that we've all worked with clients they can never tell you exactly what they want so right. they can't write props themselves so anyway right yes. well and the way in the the except that those people who can't give you good direction don't really have a good eye for it anyway yes so whatever they get will be good enough because exactly. they didn't have to pay for it exactly so there will still be i think a a difference between good design and cheap design yeah that i don't think that will will exactly go away but we both look we both know how businesses and large companies and capitalism works cheaper is better no matter what I I have I remember a conversation. I probably had it more than once with more than one person, account person, and when I worked in agencies, who said, "It's good if the client buys it. It's good if the client doesn't buy it. It's bad." Right. And I said, "That's absolutely ridiculous. Clients buy crap all the time, and they often don't recognize really good." work especially really breakthrough work because yeah. they're afraid of it they don't recognize it they don't understand it if they could understand that they'd be working in creative as well and so and yeah. as a as a commercial designer you're you're not just pleasing an aesthetic you are trying to accomplish a goal exactly and when if you're if you're poor work doesn't accomplish the goal you're blamed not the client yes. who picked your shitty work y you suffer for it i i have told i told uh, had this discussion again many times never never show the client something that is unacceptable work because you're sure they'll never pick it to give them yeah, right. you got to give them three choices and you you've got two great ones and one that is terrible it said ratting's law the <laughs> the likelihood that they will pick the worst of the options is um you know directly proportional to how bad it is yeah so, <laughs> so um, how how directly or inverse proportional to how likely you thought they would yeah were to pick it so um because they they don't know um, right, they, sure. And that's the difference between um, thinking that cr creatives, designers, writers, um, all of those kinds of work are just order takers rather than business consultants. Right. Which is yeah. what they should be. Um, I've, I taught design for quite a few years. Um, which included software, teaching software. So teaching Photoshop for um, pixel-based image uh, manipulation. Right. And taught, uh, included an illustrator in vector-based illustration right. and uh, InDesign for layout where you bring everything together. Um, as well as principles of design. I've taught design. I taught design for many years. I'm glad I don't 
teach design anymore. I enjoyed it. I liked doing it, but it would be, uh, I think the struggle now to, to teach it in a way that was based on fundamentals rather than entirely software based entirely here's a quick tool to do this thing rather right. so so you know, it, it would be challenging so i yes I, I imagine it would i can't it's hard for me to imagine trying to teach someone what we both think of as basically cheating yeah but uh, so yeah. here's so here's like the big question I've got with this whole thing and what, what I wanted to talk about more specifically was I think there's inevitability to this and it, and it's driven by capitalism in that it, it's going to, there will reach a point where you no longer feel it necessary to pay a creative to give you something that's good enough. Yeah. Right. You can get something that's good enough as long as it's cheap, it's good enough. That's easily had now. <clears throat> so, and we see it posted on social media all the time. There are companies who just generate crap and put it out there for clicks and yeah. and comments and hoping to monetize it somehow. Yeah. So it's already a business model. Yeah. Other businesses are going to catch up inevitably as they always do. And I think that we are going to reach a point where certain businesses are going to s no longer see a need for a human, for a body, you know, on-prem or whatever, to do that work. Yeah. That, like you said, they can buy the software or they can, they can get a subscription to the software that's cheaper than hiring an employee. And this doesn't just go for generating artwork. It's, like you said, it's generating reports and analyzing reports and it, it's doing a lot of things that humans currently do and this is true of every every industrial technology throughout history yeah well the difference certainly is that, yeah go ahead the difference i see though is this is specifically work of the human mind not just physical labor. Yes. And that, when we thought about robots, you know, in the same vein we thought about flying cars, right. we thought they will be there to do the drudgery, to do the manual labor, to do the dangerous and physically difficult things, to free us all for labor of creative labor of the mind, of the spirit, of the heart, of the things that we create, uh, the art uh, of yes. any sort. Um, instead, it's going to replace the creative work and leave all the rest, all the humans to do the drudgery, right? Right. It's like- because a, it's, at not right now, it's still cheaper to pay a human than build a robot. Yeah. And but I, it, <laughs> it's it's um, yeah the there was a Twilight Zone episode many 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 years ago original Twilight Zone where a factory was being industrialized and, and mechanized and robots and the um, boss called the I think one remaining employee in and let him go. And then sat back and enjoyed it and turned around in his chair. And then his chair turned around again and there was a robot sitting there. Right. And it, it replaced him too. And there was nobody, no no humans working there. Now that's an exaggeration to make a point maybe, but I, I've been to stores where there's only self-checkout. Hmm. There's somebody watching in case you need help. Right. Well, yeah. Or but, to, uh, to unlock your liquor bottle. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. 
um, I don't want someone doing my writing or design or painting or illustration or thinking or creative where I don't want a person doing that. I won't want a machine doing that. I, I can, I've been asked about what I think about using, and I've read a lot of articles about it. What about, you know, the school papers will go away because it's so easily done by, by um, AI. So school reports, school papers. Well, no, I'm not sure. That's, I'm not sure what you mean by school paper, like a, a school, school paper, news, a re, school write, newspaper. No, write a report, a, oh. a paper on, a, write a book report, write a paper, a history paper, write a those kinds of papers. Um, okay. will go away. Um, and I've seen articles on how instructors can use AI now that they can't assign reading and writing projects anymore and i know it's it's a the the old trope of the dumb jock who pays the smart nerd to write his paper for him yeah well the smart nerd is ai yes it's, it's a form of plagiarism it is another entity doing your work for you it is it's unacceptable. I won't accept it. I'm still teaching a couple of courses. I won't accept that. And well, and there see, and now we get into, for me, the the larger existential dystopian problem with all of this yeah. is that of just like we have seen in late stage capitalism, right? And I've told you before, I'm a I'm a I'm a believer in capitalism as long as it's regulated so that capitalism, I believe, is, is the way, the only fair way for someone to improve their lot. <clears throat> or it's at least it certainly depends easier. on your definition of capitalism, because the current system, of course, was where people with capital can make money from their money yes and anyway there that's another topic lengthy right. topic but what we are seeing we are seeing it's very clear everybody recognizes that we are seeing wealth is now moving upward to a to some sort of pinnacle the, and has been in that doing that for 40 years yes yes agreed and it's it's not slowing down it's accelerating this is kind of the same thing to me that before those people who are at the top and controlled that capital had to go to someone to do the thing that they couldn't do. That is no longer going to be necessary. So what will happen, or at least it won't be perceived as necessary. What will happen when, you know, just like, in, to me, perfect capital monopoly, the game monopoly was was designed to to illustrate capitalism, un, unregulated capitalism, wherein at the end of the game, one person owns all the property and has all the money. Yeah. And well, everybody else has nothing. Well, and the game is over. Yeah. There's no you can no longer play the game. So what happens when? five or six people have have all of the wealth concentrated in this country concentrated in their control and in their accounts what happens to everyone else what happens to government what happens if nobody can if nobody can work who has to work what has traditionally happened throughout history revolution revolution yeah but but what do we if we, if what do we revolve to in a situation like that? Well, that's a good question. If if all of our labor has been the necess the necessity for your labor has been taken away. It's not just 
somebody else is doing my labor and I can no longer get paid. Now it's not even, nobody can do that labor. A machine is doing it. Yeah. And this is a dystopian trope too. I mean, well, I it's think not in, just in, about. Not just it's not, about. Yeah. It's not just about taking my job. It's my job no longer exists. Yes. I and can't, I can't destroy the machine and then go back to doing my job. It's certainly been the case that um, machines have industries change, machines change, jobs change, but this is this appears to be different for the reason you you said. It's not like people can then shift into another job, another career if there are no jobs because right. of that. There. Are, so in in some of the dystopian novels there are hidden pockets of <laughs> resistance uh, uh, res agrarian societies that develop where yeah. they grow their food and they make things by hand and it's um and i think there's a reason for that i think that people crave authenticity the more artificial manufactured soulless stuff is the more people crave the authentic and, well, and you know what i don't know that it's just authenticity it's agency yes yes I'm, I'm both of those i'm you've certainly seen it in music in that oh, yeah. um in the the entities that control music distribution um gravitate towards a sameness right and as a genre of music becomes more popular, all the all the efforts in that genre become more similar. Um, and <clears throat> um, the the somebody will come along and do something in any arena, do something different, despite opposition it becomes popular then there are, everybody copies it and right you know after after star wars came out the first star wars came out how many bad <laughs> science fiction ripoffs were there oh yeah or or conan conan the barbarian how many Another, yeah, yeah exactly how sure. many bad um lord of the rings type fantasies have there been um there's but i i do think people crave authenticity reality and agency as you said um so i think that there's i think that there's going to be a backlash there is a backlash against the artificial and the the uh, artificially generated but it doesn't won't matter in some sense because the people who don't like it don't want it don't have agency they don't have the power to resist it in some ways right I, I mean i would like to see maybe the next generation of of politicians start talking about the economic realities of yes. what what this could bring i mean things like i mean we have a copyright and patent office yeah the, the, and it's run by the government so I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't extend that to, you know, uh, if this if you're using generative AI, you everything is watermarked to use if you're using generative AI, and not just visually watermarked, digitally watermarked. Yeah. Some I don't know some kind of legislation for that. Um, I think one I of the problems. I'm not tech savvy enough to to put forward a real solution. Well, and and you are far more tech savvy than most politicians remember the discussions well, about the internet oh my where god politicians the one who famously said it's a series of tubes yeah. right they <laughs> yeah. absolutely did not understand the technology and yeah. um people who thought the the information highway was a literal electronic path yeah <laughs> Um, so I, I've seen 
AI generated, AI generated, artificially generated human likenesses as spokespersons. Yeah. They and can, that's thing. instead of subtitles in movies in a different language, they can simply have digitally have the actor yeah. speaking the language and their mouth moving correctly to it. The, the, um, well, Star Wars did that has, has already done that. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Peter Cushing was dead when yes. he appeared in the last Star Wars. Movie. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, and that's why one of the, the big issues in the writer's, the Writers Guild strike and SAG after strike, the actors strike, was negotiating about the use of AI in and and owning their own likeness. Yes. Was a yeah. big big uh yes. um, subject of that. Because one the studios wanted to scan the actor and then own the rights to that scan. So you right. can digitally recreate the actor. Yep. And I'm glad they fought that. Yes. Because that's literally putting yourself out of a job. Yeah. Um. Because again, since those companies really control what's, what is published, what is made, have yes. control the capital that goes into the money. Well, and that that's kind of the problem with capital capitalism is it's who has the capital. Yeah. And and how do those people get the capital? Well, yeah, it's generally because of somebody else's labor. So sure. And it's it in an in a regulated capitalist system mm -hmm. competition exists and someone can start have a better idea start a new company compete and keep costs under control yes keep consumer costs under control by offering a better product or undercutting this or you know there's a a check and balance in in capitalism if you unless you you completely pull the the restraints off capitalism and then it becomes a game of monopoly yeah and, and that's only, what we're we are yeah. seeing that in real time now with a half a dozen companies owning 80 percent of the consumer market yeah i i years ago was teaching a media class i it was it was it was for creative students but it was all about media because they needed to understand what media was and what the various types of w were so i organized the course each week was a different type of media and how it started the history of it and where it currently is and i was about halfway through the course and a, a student slammed his book down he said it's the same damn thing every every different thing somebody invents something somebody else takes it and profits from it lots of people spring up to, with this new thing and now it's all controlled by one company yep i said congratulations <laughs> you you've tripped you, to it you you understand yeah he said well it's so depressing i said well you can't do anything about it if you don't understand it if you don't recognize it but it was true that they're three four major mega holding corporations that control 80 80 85 percent of yeah. all advertising and marketing agencies there yeah. are three four consumer product companies there are three or four media conglomerates there are three or four yeah i mean it's the same it's the yeah. same thing you know um well and like after the after after the first the depression and then the great war the and then world war ii the same happened with the automotive industry there were yeah. there were like 20 automobile manufacturers yeah. before world war ii but the one the companies that got the big 
contracts from the government to make munitions survived and ate up everybody else. Yeah. Either put them out of business or, or outright bought them. Like, I mean, well, General Motors, Chevrolet, yeah. Pontiac, Oldsmobile, they were all actually separate companies. Yes, they weren't they just were. divisions. Yeah. They were just they were bought by General Motors, and now yeah. how many of them are left? <clears throat> well, Chevrolet. Pontiac's gone. So Oldsmobile Chevrolet, Buick, GMC, Cadillac, yeah, GMC, GMC was a was an, in fact a division of General yeah. Motors. So, yeah, Chevrolet, uh, Chevrolet, Buick, Cadillac. Yep. And Buick's may not be long. For the, Buick is now mostly made in Europe. Yeah. Well, Buick, there was a choice between which they were going to keep between Buick and Pontiac. And Buick was more popular in China. Yeah, exactly. And they kept Buick for that. Although their cars were uh, soporifics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, agreed. So, I, so I, yeah. when I was um, one agency I was at, we were doing some Buick work, and Buick went through six different taglines in a year and a half. The shortest one of which lasted less than a month. We had to keep changing the materials we were using because they kept changing the 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 tagline um it was and they because they they hadn't they didn't know who they were they had no identity that's getting into right, they were brand, just branding they were, and other stuff but so so we're those of us who've been around for more than 20 years have seen these phenomenon building to where we are now yeah and so many things have happened, have, have converged to put us where we are now. That AI, I think, is a... I would like to see it used kind of as a... Here's, a, a, here's an example for you young people of what we've been seeing happening slowly, gradually in a very insidious kind of way, mm -hmm. you people coming out of college now are going to find it difficult to more difficult to find jobs that require any skill at all. Yeah. So there's no point in training for a skill that isn't the manual labor, like a, a, a trade. And I, and while we see, I, I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist here, but we're, we're suddenly seeing, um, people talking about you know trade schools are a great yeah. alternative. Yeah, to college. Um, at the same time, I could get on to my rant about education. At the same time, the educations become higher. Educations become more expensive mm -hmm. because it was defunded by the states. Yep. It, the number and compensation of administrators increased, and because the burden of financing shifted to students they built more amenities to attract more students in competition um all of that has has led to people viewing colleges as some glorified kind of trade school an investment that you're supposed to get yep. a rather than a training ground for your mind a place where you can experience and try different things to find the thing that you are is a path for you is a, a thing for you. And so we see people talking about trade schools. I'm not opposed to trade schools, which essentially the community colleges have become the de facto trade schools in a lot of ways. Um, I'm not opposed to that. I just want people to understand that if you do a trade that involves physical labor, it is tough work. And yes. by the time you're our ages, you're going to, even before yeah. that, you're going to be feeling it. You're going to have and, to retire. It's not a question those, of whether you're able or not. Yes. And the defunding of the, the attack on unions by the same people. Which is means, crazy. 
means that union pensions have largely gone away. So it's it does sound when you put it all together, it sounds like a conspiracy. I don't think anybody sat down or group of people sat down and said, here's our 50 year plan. I think it was just the logical progression yes. of greedy motherfucker to greedy motherfucker. What can we do? And I okay, think, but know, I think some of those greedy motherfuckers are running media. Yeah. And I think, yeah. I, like I said, I mean, it, it, I hating the conspiracy theorist part of this, but it seems to me like we're, we're because those GMs, those greedy motherfuckers know yes. what's going to be happening in the job market that they're going, yeah. they are going to be replacing <laughs> intellectual work yes. with AI, but they're still going to need plumbers and electricians and carpenters to build their homes and maintain their, their cottages or whatever. Yeah. So I, uh, it's easy for me to believe that they're pushing people towards those manual labor jobs. They're raising costs on this because we're not going to, we're not going, you know, as long as you'll give us, as long as we can keep, um, bending you over your student loans yeah that'll that's great for a while but people are already getting tired of that are getting are tripping to that yeah so i think that they are being pushed young people are being pushed into trades because they haven't found a way to replace those things cheaply well yes i have seen though and here's like the first indication or one indication there are places you go into like a fast food place mm -hmm. and you order on a kiosk. Yep. And you don't even, you don't even have to talk to somebody to order the food. You order it, sure. you order exactly what you want. You pay for it. A person is still making it in the back, but there Again, are. Because there... it's still cheaper to hire a person than build a robot to do it. Except there are robots being built that, flip burgers and yeah they're just too and, expensive they're just too expensive right, yet right those will be replaced yeah yeah i i'm <laughs> you know we'll just be standing in line for our soylent green <laughs> soylent so. green is people well all those people that couldn't get jobs guess where they are soylent going. <laughs> green yeah there you go mm. and that's was true in the movie too i mean that yeah. was you know the the unwanted the, the I don't remember what they ethical called them, suicide but... parlor. You remember that? Yeah, you can't find a job. You can't. There's That's no Edward G. Robinson's last movie role. Was and it? he was he was brilliant and touching. It was poignant. He was he was he was so good, and he looked even better because he was acting alongside. Um, Charlton Heston, Heston, who he's he's a wooden profile. I mean, <laughs> he'd, well, like a lot of movie yes. stars, yes, of that like, era, yeah, like um, Peter O'Toole in My Favorite Year. Peter O'Toole was a great actor, but that he was specifically in that movie playing that kind of actor playing Errol Flynn basically yeah well but yeah. his but the line that always the line that I love from that movie the mess is like I'm not an actor I'm a movie star yeah <laughs> and it's so yeah. true of of you know that the whole um uh movie studio that whole says industry that there system. were there were people who rose above that um but famously yes. had the really good ones had a lot of conflicts with studios. There's a story about um, Catherine Hepburn, who was <laughs> terrific. Yep. Um, she she wore pants. She wore trousers, and this was in an era when it was kind of outrageous for women to. And the studio didn't like it. They didn't think it fit her image. They said, "You may no longer wear pants." So she walked around the studio in her underwear. Yeah. <laughs> until they said. 
Okay, you can wear pants. So, yeah. So anyway, anyway, um, yeah, we we've gone from from generative AI to late stage capitalism, and now we're talking about old movie stars. Yes, so I, I, so I think we have we've pretty, gone through the prescribed yeah. number of digressions. Yes, something that AI could not do. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it couldn't do it as well. Certainly. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so anyway, um, we may. We talked about before we started recording. We talked about revisiting this with someone who is using AI on a more regular basis as a p potential counterpoint for this. Yes. But I think if we throw some of these points at him, I want to see. I want to make him squirm a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see if we can do that, and yeah. if that uh, comes up as a, another episode. So. Right. Anyway, I think we have. I think we this. have. Yep. So. Be authentic make things think about things write something and do it yourself get your in, hands in, dirty in, in get your mind right to dirty. us getting your in hands particular dirty. right to us yeah. with with you know your ideas for uh new new subjects yes. for us to talk yes. about um we don't have like a, a captcha thing so if you if you're a robot please like anyway and share and uh yeah and please come back and and see us again we yes. love to have you and we really really could use as demonstrated we really could use <laughs> some more subjects i think it's interesting that getting your hands dirty is different than getting your mind dirty i prefer to do both frankly yeah well, well okay <laughs> often at and the with, same time <laughs> and, and with that until we see you next time, be thou a good night and true.